Hello everyone, and welcome to the 178th episode of Analyzing Evil, featuring our patron pick for April 2024, Makima from Chainsaw Man. So I'll just say it right away before I go any further. At the time I'm making this video, the Chainsaw Man anime is currently only on its first season. And because of that, you might be wondering why Makima is even being featured in an episode. However, the manga's story is far beyond that, and I'm going to be talking about it extensively in this video. So if you've only seen the anime, this video is going to contain heavy spoilers for the first part of the entire Chainsaw Man story, and if you'd rather wait a while before diving into this topic, you're more than welcome to close this video out now. But if you're sticking around, in this video we're of course going to be talking about Makima, the control devil whose all-encompassing machination set the stage for a series of events that nearly has the entire world being completely dominated by this devious devil of monumental power. But of course, before we begin, we need to talk about something I'm very excited to be sharing with you all. Love reading but hate carrying books to work? Appreciate good animated stories? but too tired from the commute? And you keep falling victim to endless doom scrolling? If only there was a way to read watch cool animation and replace doom scrolling all during your commute. Introducing Storyiverse. Storyiverse combines short story prose with stylistic animation to provide you with a new way to experience stories. All these stories are original and exclusive to Storyiverse, and they're catered to mature audiences with complex themes and deep character development. Also, all read-watch experiences are uniquely created by talented writers and animators from around the world. So go on, download Storyiverse now. I mean it, go download it now. Now without further ado, let's begin. The year is 1997, and in the alternate world of Chainsaw Man, many things are different when compared to the same time period in our universe. In this version of our world, the Soviet Union never collapsed, and things like World War II, the Nazis, AIDS, and nuclear weapons no longer exist. Similarly, a few things and concepts unique to this universe, such as something called SOA, a fictitious syndrome named Arnalone, an eruption of a volcano called Mount Heo, a sixth sense that humans used to have, the light of a particular star that would break children's minds, and four possible conclusions other than death at the end of living beings' lifespans used to exist, but exist no longer. The reason for these erasures has to do with the titular hero of our story, Chainsaw Man, and the devils he fights. In this universe, there exist entities known as devils who we might call demons in our own. As for us, there is typically only one devil that we refer to, not many. Regardless, they're demons in all but their names. But devils do have a unique way of coming into existence. A devil is born via the fear humans experience for a certain object, living creature, concept, or natural phenomena. For example, there exists a darkness devil, one of the more powerful devils who was born through humanity's fear of the dark. It's unknown at the time I'm making this video how exactly devils manifest on Earth, but when the corresponding fear of a certain thing grows large enough within our collective consciousness, a devil that represents that fear is born in Hell, and they can then somehow make their way to Earth to begin terrorizing humanity with the powers granted by whatever fear they embody. With lower level devils like the Tomato Devil afforded less capabilities due to humanity's less severe fear of tomatoes, and more powerful devils like the Gun Devil posing a much more significant threat to living beings, due to the more intense fear that guns can instill within us. Aside from the unique powers they're granted through their fear, and the different levels of power they receive depending on said fear, all devils share a general set of powers as well, those being the ability to heal themselves by consuming blood, creating contracts with humans that allows them to use some of their powers in exchange for some kind of sacrifice, eating the flesh of more powerful devils to empower themselves, corpse possession, and most importantly, reincarnation. Any devil that is killed on Earth is reincarnated in Hell and any devil that's killed in hell is reincarnated on earth, which makes them effectively immortal. There are only two ways that a devil can truly die, either by the fear they were born from no longer being considered a fear, thus eliminating their life source, or if the same thing occurs when Chainsaw Man eats them. Chainsaw Man, or Pochita, seems to be quite the unique devil, and not just because he's perhaps the most powerful devil, even stronger than the Four Horsemen, the Hell Devil, and all the primal devils like the Darkness Devil, or the Fall Devil, but because Chainsaw Man can completely erase any devil and all fears associated with that devil simply by eating them. 
All of the things I listed earlier no longer exist, because Chainsaw Man ate their corresponding devils at some point, and erased them and their fears from existence. This gives Chainsaw Man the unique position of being the devil that all devils fear the most, as well as being the one devil that's actually an overall net benefit to human society. Until Pochita met Denji, he hated humans, but even so, the positive effects of Chainsaw Man's elimination of devils, and the fears associated with them, is beneficial to humans, whether he dislikes them or not. Now why does all of this matter as far as Makima is concerned? Because Makima and her plans are intimately tied to Chainsaw Man. Makima, the control devil, is a member of a group of devils known as the Four Horsemen, devils that are analogous to the legendary Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse of our universe, those being conquest, war, famine, and death. The only change here is that Makima is either referred to as the control or the domination devil, but the words for conquest, control, and domination in Japanese use the same kanji, shihai, so while her name might be a tad different in Chainsaw Man, she represents the Horseman of Conquest regardless. It should also be noted that the Horseman of Conquest is sometimes referred to as the Horseman of Pestilence, as scholars believe conquest to be too similar to war, warranting a further differentiation between the two. This idea has its roots in the fact that the Horseman of Conquest is depicted with a bow and arrow, and bows and arrows were commonly infused with poison or even feces to make their impact upon piercing a human's body far more devastating, which is a rather interesting fact that I wasn't aware of prior to making this video. While Makima doesn't necessarily have anything to do with Pestilence directly, some of her powers are tied to this alternate depiction of the Horseman of Conquest, which we'll be discussing a bit later on. Now several years before this story began, Makima battled with Chainsaw Man alongside the other Horsemen and the Seven Weapon Devils, and during this battle, the Horsemen essentially won their fight against Chainsaw Man when he fled to Earth gravely wounded, forcing him to assume his Pochita form. So why were the Horsemen fighting Chainsaw Man? Well at this point, we don't know for certain, but I think it's safe to assume that just like the other devils of hell, the horsemen feared Chainsaw Man because he was the only thing aside from a complete erasure of their fear that could kill them, and considering conquest, war, famine, and death aren't likely to be something humans lose their fear of, it makes sense that they want to eliminate the only true threat to their existence. Now eliminating Chainsaw Man, or perhaps binding him to their will considering he can reincarnate like any other devil, seems to have been the goal of the four horsemen as a group. But once Chainsaw Man escaped them, the four horsemen split up to presumably search for his whereabouts on Earth. And if Makima's actions are any indicator, whatever plans they had for Chainsaw Man as a unit were abandoned once they went their separate ways and began blending into human society. Makima in her human form appears to us as a woman in her 20s with pinkish orange hair and yellow eyes with red rings in them. Makima is almost always seen wearing the Public Safety Commission standard uniform of a white button-up, black tie, black slacks, and black dress shoes. But at a few points in the story, we do find her dressing more casually. By the time the story begins, Makima has risen to the highest ranks of the Public Safety Commission as the personal devil hunter of the Cabinet Secretary and the leader of the Experimental Squad 4. But not only that, she's also enabled and protected by the Japanese government, as she has entered into a contract with the Prime Minister of Japan that stipulates her survival in the case of her untimely demise by redirecting her death to a random Japanese citizen. But even on her own, Makima is incredibly powerful, as though she has all the standard devil abilities. As one of the Four Horsemen, her unique skill set is far beyond that of your typical devil. Her most physically devastating powers come in the form of her ability to manipulate some mysterious force that allows her to accomplish some seriously destructive feats. The first time we're exposed to this power, we're shown that Makima is able to use human sacrifices to crush others by having them say the person she wants to kill and then performing hand signs that then send energy to obliterate whoever her sacrifice named. She can also use this same power to point her finger at someone or something and utter the word bang, sending an invisible missile at her target that can completely destroy them if they're human, a lesser devil, or fiend, or seriously wound more powerful entities like the darkness devil. As harrowing as these powers are, what Makima really relies on to get the better of both humans and devils are her powers of control. Makima is able to control any number of people, devils, fiends, or animals that she perceives as being lesser than herself. And if it's a devil or fiend that she's in control of, she can also use their powers by summoning them with chains and using them as puppets. And she can even alter the memories or personalities of people she has under her control. In accordance with her association with pestilence, Makima is seen controlling rats, birds, and perhaps even insects to use their sight and hearing to spy on people all across the world. And she even has the ability to use a pack of rats to teleport herself across long distances. Needless to say, 
Makima is a powerful individual who has amassed considerable personal and political power in Japan, and seemingly the entire world. As save for the United States, all world leaders and governments fear her as a force they're powerless to stop, whose ambitions are liable to destroy the world as we know it, which has made it so she's in the best position out of her sisters to find Chainsaw Man. Now at this point we're going to start talking about Makima and her plans, but rather than working through her actions chronologically, in this case, it's best that we examine her plans and what her end goal is first, so we can look back at everything she's done in this story to better understand how every action she's taken factors into this plan. As the control devil, Makima is driven to conquer and dominate, and like all creatures born of fear and evil, Makima is as selfish as any other devil. And as I said a moment ago, her and her fellow horsemen probably had a plan when it came to killing or binding Chainsaw Man. But once they separated, each likely made assurances that they were still working together. But in reality, they definitely weren't. Which is quite evident by Makima's plan, putting Chainsaw Man under her control so she could absorb him and use his powers to control all humans and devils. Makima planned to subjugate Chainsaw Man through a power of hers that lets her control those who she perceives as lesser than she, and because Chainsaw Man is superior to her by leaps and bounds, there was only one way for her to do so. Find the injured Chainsaw Man in his near-death state, and take control of him that way. However, that didn't exactly go according to plan, as Bochita managed to hide himself in plain sight by entering into a contract with Denji and becoming his pet devil flying under the radar of all the horsemen due to Denji's obscure life of poverty where none of them would have thought to look for him. But because Denji was employed as a devil hunter by the Yakuza, he was bound to come in contact with at least one of the horsemen through his frequent contact with other devils. And it just so happens that he did when members of the Public Safety Commission were sent to eradicate the zombie devil, one such member being Makima. When Makima found that Denji had made a contract with Bochita and had become the new host of Chainsaw Man, she reasoned that the only way for her to get the better of Chainsaw Man in this state was to break his contract with Denji by destroying Denji so utterly that he would give up on life. Why? Because when Denji was nearly killed by the zombie devil, he entered into a new contract with Pochita, and this contract stipulates that Pochita will give Denji his heart in return for Denji showing him the dreams he had talked about so often when they were together. So if Denji gives up the will to live, he'd no longer be able to pursue his dreams, which would void his contract, allowing Makima to confront Chainsaw Man in battle after he's been freed, defeat him, and control him. As if she manages to beat Chainsaw Man in battle, she'll make it so he's lesser than she is, which will then allow her to take command of him with her power. These are Makima's exact words when she's explaining her plans to destroy his life to Denji in chapter 28 of the manga. What you made with Bochita wasn't a promise, it was a contract. I asked myself how I could break that contract. How could I make you so hurt that you'd no longer be capable of living a normal life? So damaged that you'd never be able to bounce back for as long as you live? Quite the challenge, isn't it? After all, you felt plenty of happiness even living in extreme poverty with Bochita. So I decided to begin with making you a lot happier. I gave you a job and money and fed you lots of delicious food. I provided a family that would get along with you. Aki became a good big brother to you. And Power, the bratty little sister. I'd make that level of happiness your new normal and then destroy the whole thing. So everything that Makima has done from the moment she met Denji was geared towards this design. Every smile, every enticement, every reward she gave Denji, and every relationship she helped to create for him were all crafted specifically to boost him up so she could tear him down as brutally as she possibly could. And it all started with his seduction. Because Denji has such low expectations for life, a waterlogged cot and a pack of instant ramen noodles is enough to satisfy him. So in order to point his desires towards greater things in life, she started by taking advantage of the 16-year-old Denji's obsession with girls and her status as the first person to ever show him any kindness. Choosing to use her own beauty and the falsified persona of the hard-to-get yet achievable love interest who cares deeply for her new human pet to entice Denji into essentially falling in love with her while simultaneously keeping him on a short leash. Makima plays the expert seductress here using her intimate understanding of human desire to bind Denji's heart to her person. And with the knowledge of Makima's plans and her true origins in mind, it makes scenes like this, where Makima explains to Denji why grabbing a woman's breast that you haven't made a romantic connection with isn't all it's cracked up to be, by showing him what it means to be sensual and passionate with another woman, absolutely terrifying. As not only is everything she says to him in these moments false, but they're imitated human behaviors that are coming from a monster who doesn't actually know what it feels like to have these emotions, but can mimic them with perfect accuracy so that they're indistinguishable from the real thing. What adds an even greater layer of terror to this notion though, is that as a devil, humans are so inherently beneath her that she can only mimic this type of behavior, not actually express it sincerely. And despite her very convincing ability to appear human, underneath her fine veneer, 
Makima is nothing more than a demon who will do whatever it takes to make her insidious designs a reality. And just like Denji became her little pet project, every single person who Makima encounters, from the lowliest beggar to the loftiest of kings, is liable to become a part of her grand design. Because of her ability to overtly or subtly control every living being on the planet, and then some, Makima has become the ultimate Machiavellian, a demonic manipulator of the highest caliber who has agents lurking around every corner. Now Makima uses and manipulates everyone around her to further her ambitions, and aside from her infiltration of various world governments, the three more personal and tragic examples of her manipulation has to be her cultivation of Aki Hayakawa and power as pseudo-family members for Denji and her long-term manipulation of Angel. Aki, like many people whose lives were destroyed by the gun devil when he went on his rampage, has quite the tragic backstory. As a young boy, he lost his entire family in an instant to the gun devil's destructive power, and ever since then, his world has been dominated by a cold revenge that has made his entire life into one long quest for vengeance, to the point that Aki was fully prepared to give his life to the various contracts he formed with devils, just to take out the gun devil and avenge his family. However, when Denji and Power were assigned to his unit, and he was ordered to take care of them, Aki slowly underwent a change, and he grew to appreciate his life and the companionship that he had formed with his new friends. And when it came time for him to finally confront the gun devil, he was doing so in order to protect Denji and Power in a way he couldn't protect his brother when he was younger. A massive change of heart for a man who had previously given all of himself to the idea of revenge. After lifting Aki up so high though, Makima took all of it away from him again, this time making it even more heartbreaking by transforming Aki into the very thing he swore to destroy, the gun devil itself, afterwards sending him to fight Denji in a heart-wrenching battle that ends up forcing Denji to kill his brother figure. Power, though a fiend, had come to appreciate the connection she'd made with her human squadmates, and was beginning to turn a new leaf from a bratty, murderous devil into a kind-hearted woman who'd rather serve humanity than massacre it. She had become such a different person that just before she was killed for the first time by Makima, she was bringing a cake to Makima's home to celebrate Denji's upcoming birthday. But she was instantly obliterated by Makima in front of Denji to drive his spirits further down than they already had been, a moment of callous brutality that shows just how expendable the people around Makima are to her. Angel had made a life for himself on some far-off island paradise amongst people who loved and cared for him, but when Makima came calling on him one fateful day, she put him under her control, forced him to murder all these people using his power, and used him as a tool of the Public Safety Commission for who knows how many years, finally being forced by Makima to become one of her weapons, as so many others had once he had expended his usefulness as a willful being. So in these cases, Makima isn't just manipulating other evildoers or getting the better of her enemies, she's taking entire lives and making them infinitely better only to tear them down just as brutally once they've served their purpose. And as Denji explains following Makima's demise, she probably never even considered the people she was doing these things to as people. For one of the more interesting things about Makima is that she has face blindness, and while she is able to recognize people by their scent, she can't differentiate one person to the next by their faces. So even though Makima knew who she was dealing with, I imagine she filed them away as pawn number 10,463 with so-and-so power or use that she could call on whenever she needed to. And the fact that all these people and creatures are nothing more than faceless playthings to her that are no more important to her than the rats and pests she uses for the very same purposes speaks volumes about Makima's character. And because her regard for human life was so low, every single person on the planet was liable to be expended if they needed to be in order for Makima to achieve her goal of obtaining Chainsaw Man's power for herself. Now all of this seems monumentally evil. As a godlike megalomaniacal demon aiming to achieve even more godlike power to completely dominate and control the entire world, or perhaps even the entire universe, is about as diabolical as it gets. However, there's something interesting that Makima states to Captain Kishibe that seemingly softens the scope of her nefarious ambitions. Makima tells him that she wants to use Chainsaw Man to create a better world for humans, and that she could get rid of the many things humans would be better off without, like death, war, and hunger. Something that may support the idea that Makima is in fact a virtuous figure, rather than a villain, is that Makima also comments after she's taken control of Aki and Angel that the scenario where the most damage is going to be inflicted is playing out, something that she regrets. So was Makima lying to Kishibe? Yes, I believe she was. It's true that with Makima controlling all of humanity, they'd enjoy some sort of peace and prosperity, as her godlike powers combined with the even godlier powers of Chainsaw Man would make her nigh invincible and capable of eliminating any threat to herself or humanity, which would make it so the world would technically be better off with her at the helm. But when Makima states that humans would be better off without certain fears, she specifically names war, death, and famine as concepts she would eradicate. 
Earlier I mentioned that the other four horsemen that make up her sisterhood are the Horsemen of Death, War, and Famine, and it's no accident that she names these three specifically as examples of what she would rid the world of, for outside of Chainsaw Man, and perhaps the Primal Devils, the Horsemen are the greatest opposition to Makima's total control of the entire world and everything in it. So yes, Makima would make the world a better place in many respects, as in order to secure her power, she would need to rid it of the devils powerful enough to oppose her, but she would only be doing so by accident. Unlike other devils who derive much of their purpose from massacring humans in so many ways, Makima, whose entire being is tied to domination and control, wishes to subjugate devils and humans alike because it was what she was born to do. It is in her very nature to seek out the control of everything around her, and while that would incidentally make the world a better place, that matters little in the grand scheme of things, as under Makima, humans would have no freedom, no self-control, only the hand of Makima the Great and Powerful guiding them in everything they do, a queen who would rule for all eternity as the lord of everything before her that would usher in a golden age of prosperity, but also a dark age of unprecedented repression. But as is quite common with villainous figures, Makima severely underestimated the people she was looking to subjugate, and through a bit of cunning on Denji's part, Makima was not only defeated, but killed in a way that only a hybrid devil embodying the power of the Hero of Hell could through consumption, ending the life of a ruthless manipulator whose ambitions for world domination knew no bounds, and who were all better off without. Though this might be true, according to Pochita, in a way, what Makima was trying to accomplish was as heartbreaking as everything she had put others through. After Makima is defeated, and Denji is speaking to Pochita, he asks Denji to grant the new reincarnation of the control devil her wish, the wish that Makima had before her. Pochita says that the control devil always wanted to form equal relationships with others, but she could only form relationships through the power of fear, so she always longed for something like a family. He goes on to say that that's the kind of world she wanted to create, even if she went about it the wrong way. And indeed she did, though she couldn't really help it, seeking to create a worldwide family for herself by murdering perhaps thousands of people and then placing the rest under your control is no good way to go about it. And again, even if Makima truly desired to create a family whom she could feel at peace with, the world she would have created likely would have been relegated to that of one entity's paradise at the expense of all others living in it. But Makima is gone, and in her place lives a new control devil. And well, maybe with enough love and affection, this new control devil will turn out to be something quite wondrous, instead of a demon of incomprehensible power longing for love through the power of evil. Thank you all for tuning in to this episode of Analyzing Evil, and I hope you've enjoyed. What are your thoughts on Makima? Let me know down below, and leave a suggestion for a villain you'd like to see featured while you're at it. If you like this video, hit that thumbs up button, and make sure to subscribe if you haven't already. A big thank you to all of my subscribers, my patrons, and anyone who's decided to honor me with a super thank, and a most vile thank you to those whose names you're seeing on screen now. Join the channel's Discord server and subreddit to interact with myself and the community, and follow me on the social media platforms listed below to keep up with the channel. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll be seeing you soon.